the very first presentation is on an energy related topic and it's by Mark McDougall, so thank you very much. So good afternoon folks, my name is Mark McDougall and I'm here to present my final year project to design, manufacture and test solar heat engine generator. The contents of the presentation, I'll take you through choosing a heat cycle, mine is a Stirling cycle, so I'll take you through the Stirling engine, some advantages, uses and different types. I'll take you through the design methods that I used in designing my engine. I'll take you through the design and manufacturing testing of this particular engine and then a demonstration of the Stirling engine in operation. So all you did your thermodynamics last year, Base, basic uh, heat cycle is the Carnot cycle. It's an idealized cycle, it has a lot of assumptions. Therefore the uses are strictly for comparison and research only. One thing it does establish is the Carnot efficiency, which is one minus the ratio between the low temperature and high temperature. Moving on to the Stirling cycle, the Stirling cycle achieves very high efficiencies of around 40 to 60%. It incorporates a regenerator, which is an important role within any Stirling engine. The regenerator can be seen here, and in mine it's within the manifold plates. Theoretical efficiency for a Stirling cycle is the same as a current efficiency. One minus the ratio between the low temperature and the high temperature. Advantages of Stirling engines. They can use multiple heat sources. As long as they can get heat to the external cylinder, they should be able to operate. They're mechanically simple, they, don't, they have less seals, less valves, and require virtually no lubrication. They have a long life, and they have a diverse range. If you make them really small, you can produce milliwatts of power output. If you make them really big, you can get megawatts of power output. They're also an air-independent engine, which means as long as it gets its heat supply, and it has the volume within it, it should be able to operate. The future and present uses of the Stirling technology. At the moment, there's a lot of research going into solar electricity generation, also, combined heat and power, I don't know if you've come across it, combined heat and power for isolated domestic areas. As I said, it can be used uh, for multi-fuel combustion, also weight heat, uh, electricity generation, so it's looking at your uh, steam plant, steam uh, energy plants and your nuclear power plants, taking the waste heat energy that they give off to the atmosphere and putting in your sterling technology. Biomedical power is also a technology I'm really interested in, and it involves designing micro sterling engines, uh, that will run off the heat of your biological heat for uh, circulation of your blood, so basically an artificial heart. A cryocooler is an also another interesting technology. The Stirling engine operates by introducing heat and getting out mechanical work. A cryocooler is a Stirling engine in reverse, putting in mechanical work and getting extremely low temperatures at the low temperature region. And at the moment, the technology can achieve temperatures below minus 150 degrees Celsius. And also NASA is looking into vacuum electricity generation for bringing the Stirling engine outside our planet's atmosphere. So engine configurations, three basic types, your alpha, your beta, and your gamma. This is a gamma type Stirling engine. Design methods, I use three. Initial design, first order design, and second order design. The initial design methods took the Stirling cycle, which has a lot of assumptions. The first order design method then tries to take away some of those assumptions and just focus on a more realistic engine. And then the second order design methods took even more of those assumptions away and look at optimizing your engine, considering component inefficiencies, heat and mechanical losses. So, starting with the certain cycle, very basic PV work diagram. You can see here you have your isopark heat addition through regeneration, and isopark heat rejection through regeneration, and your isothermal compression and expansion. It's a very simplified uh, work output of the Stirling cycle. And analyzing that cycle, we can get uh, what sort of performance characteristics we get in terms of working and work out. We can get our network. So then our power efficiency based on temperatures is 61%, and our, and our efficiency based on work is 63%. First order design methods, we're now looking at the actual engine. As you can see, much more realistic PV work diagram. Now there's a couple of ways of determining the work output of, a, of an engine. You can use um, numerical or analytical methods. An analytical method is to use trapezoidal method of integration, which is basically finding the area enclosed in the curve. There's also numerical methods, such as uh, using the center equation I found handy, and there's a couple of different versions for that. So we're looking at, at a work output of a more realistic engine of 19.6 joules. And if you turn back to this, the work output was 90 joules. So we're now down to 19.6 joules. 
Second order design methods, I won't go into the maths, but basically what, what I did in this is looked at regenerator inefficiencies, uh, the inclusion of uh, engine dead volumes, which is unavoidable in realistic engines, mechanical and uh, fluid friction losses, reheat losses, shuttle conduction and static heat conduction losses. So the performance summary, you can see here that the efficiency is getting lower and lower as we remove some of these assumptions made with the original cycle analysis. So the theoretically, theoretical maximum efficiency for this engine is 34%, but that's down on paper. And what I want to achieve with this engine is to get what the actual efficiency is. So this is the SS150, the Stirling system, first iteration, 50cc. It's a gamma type Stirling engine, 50 cubic centimeters, 67 items, 30 of which are manufactured myself in the workshop. It's over an hour proven one time. I have 88 dedicated hours put into the workshop and countless more put into designing it. 300 photographs and nearly an hour's worth of documented footage. Design and manufacturing, I want to just talk about some um, important components, the roles and the chosen design. So as I said, 67 items, 30 of which are manufactured, utilizing materials such as aluminium, stainless steel, silver steel, brass, and copper. So the manifold plates house the displacer assembly and the power assembly. It also consists of a brass bushing to allow the frictionless os oscillation of the displacer piston. And it also consists of a regenerator, which is made up of six slots, which allows the transfer of the fluid, working fluid, from the displacer assembly to the power assembly. Moving on to the displacer cylinder. The displacer cylinder is a stainless steel cylinder with 1.5 mil wall thickness. Its role is to transfer the thermal energy to the working fluid at the high temperature zone and from the working fluid at the low temperature zone. An ideal displacer cylinder is designed to have high thermal conductivity across the latitude, which is cross-sectionally, and low thermal conductivity across the longitude, which is along the length. Inside of the displacer cylinder then is the displacer piston. The role of the displacer piston is to transfer the working fluid from the high to the low temperature zone. An ideal displacer piston will have low viscous pumping losses, low thermal conductivity, low weight and be non course. My displacer piston design consists of a stainless steel tube supported at both ends of the aluminium caps with a silver steel conrod. The bearing housing simply houses the bearings and the bearing sleeve which will later house the shaft. The flywheel is a rotation energy storage device. With the kinetic energy it can potentially store is directly proportional to half the rotational moment of inertia times the angular velocity squared. To, for an ideal flywheel, you must design it to have high exterior ring mass, which is I've utilized with the, the, the stainless steel outer ring, and low interior mass, which is why I've utilized the aluminium, which will house the shaft. So assembling the flywheel, the shaft, and bearings, and also crank wheel here, we get the flywheel assembly. The phase angle is a very important feature. The optimum phase angle is 90 degrees. <coughs> By having the power piston lag in the displacer or vice versa, I can direct which way the engine will rotate. By increasing the phase angle, I can increase the power output of the engine, but at around 100 to 120 degrees, we get jerk rotation, which is unsuitable for electricity generation. And then decreasing the phase angle will produce less power. The power assembly is as such, and it consists of a power cylinder, power piston, the clevis, and the crankshaft. Its role is to convert the working fluid's expansion to linear motion, where the linear motion is then converted into rotational motion by the flywheel. It's designed to be low weight, have low coefficient of friction, and require no lubrication. And finally, the brass heater cap, which I have here. Its role is to improve solar thermal transfer to the working fluid, and it's designed to have high thermal conductivity, which is why I've utilized brass, and have a large surface area, which is why I've utilized the fins. So assembling everything we have so far. So you've all heard of ANSYS, but you have no idea what it does. What I did <laughs> is to justify my design, looking at the displacer cylinder material, comparing stainless steel and aluminium. I also looked at heater cap effectiveness. So to quickly run through what I did, I applied a 400 degree C uniform temperature here in the red at the high temperature zone. The blue here on the top diagram is the low temperature region and it reached a temperature of 84 degrees C, which equates to a kernel efficiency of 79%. <coughs> 
utilizing aluminium and giving it the same conditions, 400 degrees C, the high temperature. The low temperature region reached a temperature of 189 degrees C, equating to a current efficiency of 53%. It's a 66% reduction in the temperature and 26% in the, in, in the current efficiency. I also looked at the brass unit cap, I'll just quickly run through this. Uh, potentially it can increase the heat length from 15 millimeters to 42 millimeters. However, it does unfortunately increase the lower temperature region from 84 to 96 degrees C. The Fresnel lens is what I use for focusing solar radiation. Uh, just some important figures were I was getting in a solar with a 430 watts per meter squared, which is below average for Ireland to be honest. Uh, spot temperature focusing at 10 mil diameter, getting an outside cylinder stainless steel cylinder temperature of 1060 degrees C and an inside cylinder temperature of 710. So this morning I did some actual physical testing of the engine and you can see that the efficiency is going down. So I measured the camera efficiency, I was getting temperatures at the high temperature of 200 and at the low temperature 50 degrees C, equating to a camera efficiency of 75%. And then the works I calculated by putting in work of 400 watts, I was getting out 40 watts mechanical rotation, equating to an efficiency of 11%, which is quite good considering that the maximum achievable efficiency is 34%. So just to finish up, I want to say a special thanks to my supervisor, PJ McAllen, my co-supervisor, Gerald O'Donnell, some lecturers uh, whose notes really helped me and their support helped me, John Lowen, Malvern and Ryan Thomas Roach, and also some workshop staff, uh, John Newman and Paul Tierney. So this is my Sterling engine. I'll demonstrate it to you now, and I'll take any questions. Thank you very much. At the moment, it's running basically on the Thermal capacity of the stainless steel. This is around 200 degrees C. The lower temperature is about 50 degrees C. It can be powered from solar radiation, or at the moment I have out power. So this has an efficiency of 11 percent at the moment. Any questions? No one. <laughs> You most certainly can scale up and you will uh, see more losses, but a lot of the time you're designing your engine to give a certain power output, so you're looking to design for your power output, and then efficiencies become a secondary characteristic, but most definitely you can scale up, yes. Any more questions? Thank you very much for your time.